Hi there, and welcome to a new episode of Impact Talks. Today we have Pearl Arredondo with us. She's principal at the San Fernando Institute for Applied Media. I'm really excited to have you here, especially because you're an expert at education, and I have a ton of questions uh, about that. But before we jump into the topics, please introduce yourself and tell the people what you do. Awesome. I'm so excited to be here. And I'm one of the co-founders of San Fernando Institute for Applied Media. And we established this school in 2010. And it was a group of teachers who really just thought outside the box and said, what if we created our own school, our dream school, everything that we always wanted? And that's exactly what we did. We put it to paper. We went to the school board and we proposed and they accepted. And so here we are. And it's an amazing experience that we continue to refine. It's like the dream in action. You know, it continues to evolve and get better. And we adjust, trying to make the best we can for our kids. Partially why I was really excited to talk to you is because as I look into my future, I tend to see how the education in my childhood has kind of failed me. Um, I actually skipped my last year, uh, finished two years in one. There's a way to do that uh, where I'm from in Belgium, um, and then started university a year earlier. Um, what I remember from that time is that in two months during the summer, I was able to do what students uh, would do an entire year from September till June. Um, and I did it everything just by the book um, and no teacher or anything. And I kind of felt sad almost that that's kind of that, that we are able to do things in two months that we waste 10 months on. So I guess my question is, when, knowing that, uh, hearing passionate teachers um, wanting to start a new school, my first question would be, what gave you that, you know, motivation to start a new school and how did you guys do it differently? Well, I think part of the motivation was that we were working alongside people who had lost their passion, who just didn't really even want to be there anymore. And trying to hold up the weight for that just wasn't working for us. And so part of our governing um, way of being is that all of us are on one-year contracts, so including myself as the principal. So in any other industry, if you don't do your job, you don't get to stay there. And yet in education, at least here, it seems like it doesn't matter. You, you do get to stay, and you get to stay for a very long time, and you get to fail kids for a very long time before we can move you. And so that wasn't good enough for us. So all of us being on one-year contracts really helps maintain that everyone's on their A game all the time. And so that factor contributes to being innovative, to being able to take those calculated risks and change things. Um, we have autonomy over our curriculum. So we don't have to do every single thing that the district is doing. We get to go outside and think outside the box. Um, we do have, in exchange for all of that, flexibility is a lot of accountability. So we do get reviewed every single year, making sure that we're making those gains and progress. Um, but what we like to do with our curriculum is more of a project-based approach. So we wanna teach kids marketable skills, things that they can use right now. Um, you know, teaching that entrepreneurialship, getting the social justice um, in, in play because their communities need that. And so how do we teach them to be advocates for what they see around them and how they can change it? So an example of that is um, our seventh graders do, what does social injustice look like today? And how, so they go out into the community, they take a walking field trip, they learn photography. So elements of photography as they take photos of things in their community. They also learn how to reach out to community-based organizations. So they learn writing skills. They learn how to write persuasive letters. They do public service announcements. So they learn videography. And they even play those on the local trolley system. And so it's teaching them the process of advocacy as well. And so those are real life skills, real world things that you're going to need to know how to do. Um, another example would be our eighth grade. We do our version of Shark Tank. So they have to bring a product to market. And they have to write the entire business plan. So you're learning the math. You're learning, you know, where's the profit margin? At what point are you able to say, okay, well, I'm going to give away 50% of my company. Well, what does that mean? And being able to create a prototype 
we have an amazing maker space here that we have spent a lot of time building and being letting our students just get creative and think of something new and reinvent something so showing them that even as kids you can still make something and you can still bring an entire product to market who are the teachers that teach that because when i think about entrepreneurship in school i, I never learned it in school i studied law uh, so when i think about entrepreneurship in school and obviously my career for the last 10 years has been about entrepreneurship i just think i, I just genuinely wouldn't even be able to imagine what is being taught there and and if it's being taught i think it would be successful entrepreneurs like i'm thinking I know I followed one um, curriculum by Stanford where the founder of Y Combinator gives classes there. Um, and so I followed uh, an online semester there. Uh, but he had, you know, pretty much all the big names um, that passed through Y Combinator, billion dollar valuation companies, CEOs who shared kind of their knowledge. How do I would you guys love do for it? them. I would love for a big company like that to come in and help us <laughs> teach those entrepreneurial skills. I think for the most part, our training comes from just learning along the way um, and seeing what is it that, um, what's marketable right now, what's happening out in the communities and taking that and learning with our students and really making sure that we're exposing them. Because how old are the students in the school? Um, they're sixth grade through eighth grade, so they're about 11. They come in about 11 to 12 years old, to so about 13 to 14. How come, um, how come that age is the age where I tend to find a lot of these experimental schools? When I start looking, I start looking, you know, let's say I'm going to have children. I start looking at schools and almost every you know experimental school I, the other day i was watching uh, the school that elon musk uh, created that school targets the same age ages there's nothing for before that or after that is there a reason for that well i think because life trajectories really start to change in those middle years and you really can hone in on where and students have a pretty good grasp of where what direction they kind of want to go into um, but more and more schools are coming up for the younger. Like our model, our pilot school model, we do now have elementary schools, so they are starting younger. Um, I think it's a little bit more challenging because you are teaching foundational skills, learning to read, um, things like that, where as in middle school, you're refining those skills. So I think that's the, a little bit of the difference, but, but still I think it can be done in, with the younger students as well. Is there like a specific way that you guys teach that's different? You mentioned something about project based. Is it then different? Um, well, it's not a textbook and read this chapter and answer those questions. It's more of a hands on. So it's more application of knowledge. So they learn concepts, but at the same time, they have to apply that to a bigger project. So if they're learning about climate change, they have to build a structure that's going to withstand climate change. Um, so they learn the elements of everything that they need to, but there's, there's a tangible product. So kids are more engaged. They're more willing to, to learn about topics that they may not necessarily be too interested in, but also that project-based element has, um, they have to present to an authentic audience. So more than just their classmates. And that ups the ante because now it's like, oh, it's not just my teacher who's gonna read my paper and give me a grade and then that's it. It's like, no, you have now the community that you're going to present to. You need to make sure that your arguments are correct, that you have cited your sources, that you know what you're talking about. Are you able to teach all subjects like that uh, so I guess those foundational skills from elementary school are those also able to be taught with that you know project system I think you can to to a certain extent so like when you're at the beginning you're learning to read and then you're reading to learn and so it's where that transition happens um, but you can definitely do a lot of projects um, with younger students, it's just the input has to be different. It's not going to be necessarily reading based. It might be audio. It might be listening to something and then applying that particular knowledge. Whereas in middle school, they can read a particular text or they can um, they can go that way. But yeah, you can definitely do project based learning with younger kids. Um, I guess my question is, um, how do you marry 
the traditional I mean I'm just thinking how the government is with education how there's almost no movements everything has to be the same all over the country how do you innovate and how do you get green light on doing something like this <laughs> there's a lot of pushback <laughs> and there's a lot of um, friendly arguments I would say um, so we we um, do a lot of proposing to our district in terms of like when we wanted to create the maker space and at first they were like no you can't use your funding that way and it was well yes because and we had to outline everything and then it took a little bit of back and forth and then finally they were like okay and then we became the advanced prototype site for the entire district so showing that things work and being able to control your narrative um, really helps with being able to be innovative. And so I think now, 11 years later, um, we have more, we've kind of built our own street cred. So it's like, okay, they, they have some innovative ideas. We take, I think we take calculated risks. So we, we look at our data, we look at what it is that, that students need and still have those same state accountability measures. We're still, our students still have to take the same exact tests that everyone else does. And so, and so ensuring that, that we're embedding all of those same standards, but in a more um, application-based way. Do they score better with this type of education then, do you think? I think by the by the eighth grade they do. I think our students come in fairly low. We ha we're in a low income um, poverty ridden area, so you know we are battling not just academics but poverty and everything that comes with that. So our students come in low, and they by the time they leave us three years later they are at grade level. Oh wow! Um, so it's working. It just takes time, like anything else. I want to go back to the beginning, beginning. Um, I can imagine some people, especially in the education sector, we've had some ed tech startups come uh, through the event, um, probably have a ton of questions, maybe have considered starting their own schools or something like that. Um, how does that process work? Uh, because when I'm thinking about education, and, and starting anything in collaboration with schools, introducing new technology in schools. I'm just, you know, it's, it's like introducing something in, the, in an airplane. You know, it's gonna take 20 years before it gets there. Um, so can you go from the beginning um, and tell the story of like how it all started and, and worked and what it took to actually even start the first year? Sure. So we were considered a failing school. So um, we had about 2,300 students at the time and kids were falling through the cracks. There was no accountability. Um, if I taught a student in sixth grade, I didn't even know where they went seventh grade. They could be clear across on the other side of the campus and I would lose that child. So um, after a few years of that, we had a change in administration and they broke up the the big comprehensive into small learning academies, each with its own theme. So one was a visual performing arts, we had the science and agriculture, we had law and social justice, and then I was running the multimedia academy, which was all technology based. So we did that for about three years and we saw that things were working. Scores were going up, we were getting to know students and their families and their struggles. And we were able to start aligning resources and supports, something that wasn't in place before. So after about three years, it, we were still considered a failing school. Even though our scores were going up, we were doing better. We were on the right track. So at that point, the school district came out with public school choice. And they basically put it out there that any entity could write a plan to take over a school, one of these failing schools. There were 10 schools that they identified, us being one. And so there were organizations all over the place writing plans for this particular campus. And so as teachers, we were like, well, why don't we write our own plan if everyone else is writing it and some other company who isn't even into education could potentially take over our campus and that impacts us and our students, we might as well write our own plan. And so that's what we did. 
and we wrote it around the pilot school model that is um, it's based off of the Boston pilot schools. And it's kind of a misnomer because it kind of insinuates that, oh, it's a trial and it's going to go away. <laughs> but but it's not it's not really that we're we're here to stay. Um, but it, it, we are considered what is called a pilot school. And with that pilot school, there's a specific structure and there is a specific autonomy that we have. And that's overstaffing. So we get to pick our own staff. We don't have to go from the district list of, of people. Um, and that, so that's important. That's a key piece because that's where you find your innovative people. You find your former engineers who are going to come in and help run a makerspace, you know, who used to work in the industry and now they're, they're teachers. And so you find all of those people who do videography on the side and photography, and so they bring in those skills. Or they were script writers, and they bring in that for theater and, and our filmmaking. And so finding the right people is the key to anything. You can have the most amazing curriculum, but it's not going to happen unless you have the right people to help you deliver it. So could you elaborate a little bit deeper on this Boston Pilots? Like, what can I imagine with this? Could you go a bit more in detail? How is it different than other schools, except for the people, of course? Yeah, so the pilot schools are small in nature. So they're around 400 to 500 students. And the reason for them being small is because it's more personal. You're able to really get to know students, get to know families, align resources. And then it's the governing model. It's putting the decisions at the hands of the people closest to the students. So that's the teachers, that's the administrators, parents, and even students have a voice. And so everything that we do goes through our entire governing council, which is, again, of teachers, administrators, parents, and students. And so making sure that we are always transparent with what we're doing and we're keeping all of them in mind. And everyone gets a voice. And then there's also, we have autonomy over our budget, which means that we can allocate the funds based on the needs of the school and not necessarily what the district says we need to spend money on. So, and then that ties in with our curriculum and assessments. So we don't have to follow the curriculum that the district has selected. Um, instead, we just have to follow state and federal guidelines. So as long as we are following those, we can waiver against away from any of the traditional models of curriculum and that's where we brought in the project-based learning uh, as opposed to what model was there before the district was in charge of the budgeting and everything else or right so the district in a traditional school um, gives you pockets of money and then they give you specific items that you would need to buy, purchase so whether that be specific professional development that teachers need to do, um, or it's specific curriculum that you need to implement, um, or it could be anything from just resources. They're moving away from that a lot more now. In the last few years, the district has really loosened up their grip on, on all of those decisions and have tried to give that back to schools. But when we first started, that was not really in place at all. And but so- why? I don't know. That seems like such a like easy decision, right? Like let the schools decide what they need. Um, but it just wasn't like that. And and we had to fight to get that autonomy. And maybe it came down to, you know, trust. Were schools going to were they going to trust them to spend the money correctly or would they spend it on frivolous things? Um, but I think if you train your staff and they know the needs of their school, it'll happen. Because the school that you're uh, currently uh, in, that's a public school, right? We are a public school, yes. So when you said the bidding opened up or people needed to write plans, at one point you mentioned companies can take it. Oh, like how, I'm from Europe, so I'm, I can't even imagine what that means. Could you elaborate? Right. Yeah. So we had um, community-based organizations, um, nonprofit organizations that were trying to take over the school or write a plan to potentially take over the school. 
and they didn't necessarily have a stake in public education. They maybe ran like an after school program of some sort. Maybe they had like a tutoring company. Um, some, some companies were just not even education based and were still, I guess, trying to get their foot into the door. Um, and so it was looking at, well, if all of these different types of organizations and groups of people can write a plan, then why not us? And we were the closest ones to them. So, but these companies, they're all non-profit or were there also for-profit companies? Some were for-profit um, companies, but the most, most of them who actually finished, because they had to like propose, okay, we were a letter of intent and there were maybe 30 different people with a letter of intent, but then the ones who finally did submit an actual plan, it was narrowed down to probably like 10. And they were all nonprofit. And they were all almost. nonprofit organizations, um, and they were, like I said, smaller, like tutoring type, um, community-based organizations that were trying to buy for the school. What's just out of interest? What's their benefit if they're focused on tutoring? Why not just continue focusing on tutoring? What's the benefit? Is there like some goal to make more money, or like what? What am I imagining there? Yeah, I mean, I guess it more of an impact if you're if you're saturated in a school, um, if you're running a school, then your your company either potentially brings in more staffing, um, or you you spread your resources further. You have a, a larger network to be able to market your your product. Um, so that that sounds like a for profit company to me, not a not for profit. <laughs> Um, okay, so then uh, the teachers, you know, uh, do the bids, win, um, and now you go and start a school. I'm assuming the infrastructure is already there. What kind of changes were the first changes that were being implemented? I think the first changes were on school culture. We really focused on growth mindset with our students and really getting our students um, to build those relationships with our staff and with each other. Um, because when students don't feel comfortable in a school, they don't learn. And especially with so much happening in the community, um, they, come, they come to school already with so much baggage. And it's helping them kind of cope with what's happening in their outside life and knowing that they're safe when they come here. So, so how do you establish relationships? Could you go in more detail for people who don't know? Sure. So we do a lot of team building activities, um, fun challenges. So for example, we just finished our summer bridge, which was to reacclimate students to come back in person since we've been um, distance learning for so long. Um, we had two grade levels who basically had never been on campus. And, and then the eighth graders had only been here for six, about six months before we shut down. So they were fairly new too. So we did it for all three grade levels. Um, one of the activities we did was pass the pig. And it's a low stakes getting everybody in and it's you wear a trash bag with like as a poncho and we put um, soap and water on a watermelon and they have to pass it around. And it's kind of like hot potato, right? But this, this hot potato game, what it does is it creates a space for students who may be shy, who don't want to necessarily talk to other people, who don't know anyone. They, it gives them an in so that they are able to, to still laugh and play and talk and meet someone new without having to um, necessarily worry about, oh, is that person going to like me or is that person? And they can still participate. So, um, so team buildings seems almost same, similar to corporate team buildings then. Um, so I can imagine those things. My question there is because uh, I was also quite uh, poor growing up. Um, and one of the concerns was always when there were these activities outside of school hours uh, that, you know, you have to pay for that. So are these like free team buildings that you do? And is it during school hours or after school hours? Or how does that work? And maybe another thing that I would add to that Again, having been in a poor household, when I would come back, I would usually help with, you know, um, the work, the business that my parents were doing, stuff like that. So do you guys have same concerns with, you know, 
in being in a poor community, um, do students have to maybe help their parents? So is it during school hours that you do these things? Outside school hours? Are these paid activities, not paid activities? How do you manage all that? Um, it's, a, it's both. So we make sure that we do things during school hours. Um, and then we even have a morning program that starts at 6.30 in the morning, so before school, for students who need to get dropped off early, if parents need to leave um, to go to work. So they're, they're on campus as of 6.30 in the morning. And they do enrichment activities, um, more like literacy, math, um, but nothing heavy because it is kind of <laughs> it's early in the morning. But it still gets them involved in, in school and it gives them a productive space to be in. Um, and then we, we run school hours and then we have after school. And everything that we do is free to our students. So they do not have to pay for anything. Um, we have uh, community partners by the name of Educare that helps us with funding for the various activities that we do. Um, and then we, we also get grants for whether it's field trips or um, school supplies. So during the pandemic, we knew that a lot of our families were hit even harder um, financially. So we were able to purchase um, like backpacks with full of all school supplies that they were able to then pick up from school and take home. And that included our class for the makerspace because they make various things. Um, they don't just have, you know, supplies, duct tape at home that they can that they can use. So we purchased all of those pipe cleaners, all the things that they're gonna potentially need to create these projects for a makerspace class now that it was distant. Um, so we supply our students with everything. And, and yeah, during the distance learning, we did see so many of our kids babysitting the younger ones. We, we saw so many of them having to help the little ones get on school so then their school was falling behind. So teachers were meeting with students in the evenings, teachers were meeting with students on the weekends, trying to catch them up, trying to make sure that they still were able to keep up with the curriculum. Yeah, I want to I want to cover the, obviously the whole distance thing. That's an entire subject on its own. But before we dive into that black hole, uh, um, so the funding that you tend to get is from sponsors and other nonprofits in the neighborhood. Then, um, do the teachers also donate extra time? Isn't that like, can't that lead to a burnout for the teachers? Like, how how do you guys? Uh, so teachers have, they do share an extra commitment to where they are committed to doing additional activities for students. So it could be in the evenings, um, they could run clubs, it's running like school dances or putting on STEAM festivals, things like that for the students. So yes, they have to do at least two events um, per year. And so we try to share, we share it. So it's not the same people running everything all the time. And that's what helps with that, um, with that burnout aspect. Um, and I think part of the investment is that they, when they invest more time in getting to know the students, it actually makes teaching easier for them. So they're, so they're okay with that exchange where it's like, okay, well, I'm gonna have an easier time if I put in these hours after school because kids see you outside of the classroom and it's different. It's not the same when you're trying to teach them math versus, you know, you're you're teaching them how to build a rocket or you're trying to teach them robotics and it's after school. You know, it's it's a different relationship, it's a different type of feeling. Um, and then that that follows through into the classroom. So now when they are trying to teach them math, it's a lot easier to do because that student knows that you're invested in them and they put in a lot more effort. Um, but teachers do, you know, with funding available, um, especially right now after the pandemic, there's a lot of funding available suddenly. Um, so teachers do get compensated for the additional time that they put in um, as much as possible. Sometimes it's not possible and it's just kind of the nature of the job but I think everyone does it knowing that the outcome is far better. 
So this uh, funding, it's like sponsors? Who finds those? Is it the principal who goes out? I'm just imagining in a corporate environment, you have a business developer. I can't imagine that in a school. So how does that work? Yeah, as a so we do get state and federal funding. So that's the first line of that'll fund the majority of our school projects, um, resources, supplies, um, salaries, all of that. That comes all from state and federal funding. And that's based on your enrollment. Um, and your students basically are generating the funding. So then you get also specialized funding for say like English language learners. We get another pocket for our foster kids, for our low income poverty at risk students. So we get different pockets of funding. So the majority does come already from the beginning. And then when we wanna do something really special, <laughs> something way outside of um, what our funding might allow, then yeah, we do look for outside sources. Um, you know, we, we do contact companies and organizations that maybe will donate video cameras, that will donate um, film equipment, things like that. You know, since they're constantly replacing and upgrading, we don't mind taking some of their older models of, of equipment. And so, yeah, as a as an institution, we have different teachers that find different grants available. Um, I've written quite a few grants for, for the school. And so it's, it's kind of a shared responsibility that we have. It's not anything formal that is in place, but when we come across something and we, or even within our network, someone always says, hey, what about this? And let's go for it, let's write it up. So, and we would love to have someone dedicated to just that, <laughs> but it doesn't quite work like that. Clear. So out of interest, I've never been a teacher, of course. So how many hours a week does a teacher in the U.S. then give to everything? Oh, wow. How many hours? Let's see. Well, on site. So being on campus, it's a minimum of six and a half hours that teachers have to be on site. Whether you choose to stay longer than the six and a half is up to you, um, but everyone is paid for an eight hour day. So, so you still get your eight hour salary, um, but so if you choose to do those extra hours on campus or you do them at home, it doesn't matter. So, but on site obligation is six and a half hours. And then it just depends and realistically? on- Realistically? And realistically, I think, most teachers probably stay until about 4.30, 5 o'clock um, at, at school. And then they do get a one-hour conference period to prep and plan during, during the day as well. So if you're efficient with your time, um, you don't have to put in too much outside of that. You still do. I mean, it's just, it just happens just especially the more innovative you are and the more creative you are, you, you want to put together, you know, it takes time to put, teachers put together quick times to demonstrate a particular thing, whatever experiment they're going to do, all that stuff takes time. And so we, we try to be realistic with our, with our staff and, and it's kind of like a relay race because you pass the baton. There's going to be some days or some weeks where, where you just can't and you're, you're kind of low on energy and you got to pass that baton. You got to let somebody else kind of carry it that week and you recharge and you're like, okay, I'm good for, for the next round. Um, and yeah, we we're like a family. So we really support each other and we really try to maintain that high energy. So we do a lot of the team building, even with our staff, um, because that's what, that's what keeps us invested as a whole. It sounds to me almost like if you do these team buildings with the staff, with the students and everything, I mean, those sound like 60 hour weeks to me. Am I way off or? Yeah, no, it, I don't. I think some weeks might be heavier if we have like an event in the evening, for sure. For sure. It's going to be a much heavier um, because you're staying here till almost 730 at night. Um, but a traditional week won't be. 60 hours it's not that's not it's not consistently 60 hours but for sure there's okay, going to so be some 40 40 hours with the six and a half on on site on and then site. people just yeah clear 
Um, okay, makes sense. Um, I had a question uh, around like the harder topics, like how do you teach languages? Actually, this was an audience question um, from one of my team. <laughs> um, how do you teach languages and things like math uh, through this, you know, innovative way? I just can never imagine how you teach that. Yeah. So we don't teach um a separate language other than English. Um, but um, some of our students come in only speaking Spanish, and so teaching them English. So one way that we do um, incorporate some of this project-based um, learning approaches with language is narrating, narrating films or writing animations. Um, so they are still doing that digital storytelling. Um, they're practicing the language. They're using the language. Um, and it's in a more authentic way. Um, but we don't teach like anything other than English. Well, what about, do you teach things like math? And, and... Mm -hmm. So we teach math. Um, so for example, like our Shark Tank, teaching the profit margins in math when, for their product, when they're going to, they have to do the cost benefit analysis. So teaching them all of the skill sets that, go, that get involved in that. Or if they're doing, say, um, a ratios project and they're going to have to do a prototype site, well, what's the ratio that you're doing this particular plan on? And how does that translate? So, so yeah, so you're still teaching math concepts, you're still teaching measurements, you're still teaching all of those pieces, but it's more of an applied approach. Mm, so, because around that age, that's when you start learning those like more advanced math concepts like Sinus, cosinus, stuff, and stuff. <laughs> well, not quite. Uh, it's eighth grade, a uh, little bit, but it's still more like percentages and fractions and things like that. Oh, okay. So then you can actually do this Shark Tank thing. Oh, that's so smart. How would you do it though for when you get into this advanced type of math science things? Well, then you get into more advanced projects. You know, you're starting to build bridges. Maybe you're starting to build with the various angles. You're starting to. So, so there's a lot of different ways of incorporating higher levels of math um, with the engineering cycle, especially. Um, and so we try to st we start the we we carve the path for for that work to be done at the high school level. Um, we have the the local high schools are there are pilot schools as well. So our students feed into those, and they are science based as well. Some are social justice based. Um, and then the visual performing arts. And so since we are a STEAM school, so science, technology, engineering, art, and math, um, we naturally feed into, funnel into those. Yeah, that's so smart, actually. I didn't even think about that. Um, so uh, quickly on the languages thing, because uh, I'm very interested in that. Um, one of the things that happens a lot in the company is we have people from all over the world in my team, and they go through these intense language courses. Um, you get students that only speak Spanish, have to, you know, learn English really fast. Um, what have you found over a span of one, two weeks, maybe even one month, the type of projects that tend to work really well for, for language learning? Um, I think when you do a dual language approach, and so you're showing like, okay, what does it look like in your language? What does it look like in this language? And you're constantly doing kind of like that comparison. It's easier for them to grasp. Um, and so, and being immersed in it, if you're forced to use the language constantly, you're, you're, going, to, you're going to pick it up much quicker. And so giving them phrases already, you know, preset phrases, these are, this is what it means side by side with their language. And how do you, and ask, having those conversations with them, you know, what are, what are some of the phrases you think you need right now? And being able to provide that. And so, but if you use it in a project based, so what type of projects are they running? You said something about script writing, narration, how? how yeah, so they, they start with, um, they'll take like, say, simple picture books that would be maybe geared more towards elementary school. Um, and then they, they turn that into kind of like a, a narrated video that they would then read aloud. Um, we even have a partnership with the elementary schools where our students go and read to the younger kids. And so helping them grow, grow their confidence in that. So 
even if they pick one book, it's like, okay, this is the one book you're going to read when you go to that kindergarten class with those five-year-olds and six-year-olds. And so it builds their confidence, even if it's just the one that they can read. So they pretty much read small for small children, like all these books in English. That, that's really smart, yeah. Um, I, I wanted to discuss, obviously, the, what has happened in the last two years, uh, which was crazy how the school they obviously you're part of is like you said 11 years or something you've been running it um so now that you know everything went online how how did it go how could you kind of go from the beginning like how, how, what was it like how did you adopt well, yeah what did the teachers do yeah so it was in march and we um we had about a week where we were starting to hear, well, maybe we're gonna close. And it was like, okay, we, we we're potentially gonna close. And they were like, okay, you need to start giving out devices to every single student. And maybe we're gonna close for two weeks, three weeks, something like that. So have a couple weeks of lessons. Um, we use a learning management system um, called Schoology. So it was like, okay, make sure everything's on Schoology and we'll... What, what does this learning management system do? How does it look like? So the learning management system is basically a, a portal where students log in and they're able to see their classes um, separately. And so within that class, the teacher can post folders with assignments, they can post videos, they can post... And then students can also... Um, there's a way to like blog on there. There's a way to record video and upload it into the system. So it's all in one spot as opposed to getting emailed, you know, various digital projects. Everything, it's a hub for, for everything. So we had already been using that learning management system with our students. So they were well aware of how to log in, how to access, how to do, how to navigate it. And our teachers as well. Um, so we had two days to give out devices to all of our students, so Chromebooks. Um, and so we deployed Chromebooks to everyone. And then by Friday, March 13th, we shut down what we thought was going to be maybe three weeks. So initially, there was no, um, it was like you were only checking in with students via Schoology. Zoom wasn't uh, a thing yet. <laughs> oh, it was fully shut down. It was not online classes or something. No, when we first shut down, no. It was it was like, okay, we're going to come back in about three weeks, so have assignments wow. that students need to do. Um, but we were not Zooming. And you could, like, you could check in with them. So via that platform, there is a way to meet. So they teachers were still opening up sessions, trying to see who would engage. Um, but there was no requirement to engage with students. There was no requirement to hold a live session um, until probably about a month after that. And they realized, OK, I don't think we are going back. We need to start putting in a requirement to meet with students. How many people were showing up? How many children were showing up during the non-required classes? During the non-required, um, we were having teachers check in with at least one group of their kids. So that's the advisory class. Um, so they have about 20 students in there. And so as opposed to let me check in with, in one given day, a secondary teacher has about 150 students or 130. And they're separated by class periods. Um, but their advisory class, they keep those kids from when they're sixth grade all the way through eighth grade. So they build that relationship with them. And that's the social emotional class. That's where they do the career, college and career building. And it's like a 30 minute class period. It's not a full length. And how many people? So there's you? about 20 students in that. So anywhere from 17 to 20 students. So we asked them to check in with those students. That way, everyone across the board was at least checking in with 20 of their students. It may not be your subject area, it may not be your grade level, but it was your, your group. Um, so from those 20, teachers at the beginning were saying maybe 10 were, were showing up, sometimes only five. It was, it was tough at the very beginning. Um, and then slowly the Zoom element came in and teachers started Zooming with their students, um, but it wasn't consistently. It was like twice a week they would do check-ins. 
um, almost like office hours. And, and again, we were not getting the engagement that we needed. Um, and then once that school year ended, so June comes around and it ends, we're still shut down. The beginning of the school year is looming and it's like, well, it doesn't look like we're going back in person. Then they came up with a full requirement of Zooming each class period. And so that provided a lot more structure and a lot, it was a lot easier across the board for everyone because it was a consistent schedule. And um, so what we ended up doing is we went on like a block schedule, odd periods one day, even periods the next. So you're only seeing three, three classes a day um, because it's a lot, it's a different experience when you're Zooming versus when you're live and in person. I think cognitively it takes, the demand is higher um, for you to try to navigate all of the tech pieces plus um, the content. So I think like the exhaustion by like one o'clock, two o'clock was evident versus like when you're on campus and you're hands on and you're not staring at a screen for four or five hours at a time. That is int- I, had, I had no idea. I would assume, you know, people sitting at home, they don't have to like go there to school or anything and can just do their classes. I assume that you'd be able to do more. Yeah, it didn't quite work out like that. And so as much when, as... When did you start noticing? Well, we started noticing with the amount of work that was coming back in. And um, so we still maintained a 98% attendance rate. So our students were logging in. They were coming to class each day. But the productivity is what really tanked. And I think part of it was the there was so much happening at home that it was so hard to focus. You know, if they unmuted themselves, you could hear so much happening in the background that it's like, okay, how do they focus in this? Or, you know, if they turned, some of them wouldn't even turn their cameras on. If they turned their cameras on, you could see the, the types of homes that they lived in, and they were embarrassed of that. They didn't want people to see where they live. You know, some of our students live in, in, in a garage, you know, a converted garage, and you can tell that it's a garage, and, there's, and it's like they don't want you to see their home life. And so we were battling that piece and battling the the fact that a lot of our students, their families were sick with COVID. Their, their families were hit. They had moms and dads in the hospital that now they had to take care of siblings. They had moms and dads losing jobs. They had to move. And so it's like, how do you focus on school and learning when you have all of that happening? And then even the adults, the adults were, were having a hard time as well, just trying to manage their own home lives with school and their own families and their own things that they were going through. And so it was, I think, a really good time for us to slow down and to just say, okay, as much as we want to go full force ahead, um, we have to be mindful of what's happening right now for everybody. And so we slowed it down. We, We really did. And it was like, well, the, as much as we wanted to keep doing the project based and these full blown, that wasn't the reality. And we were not going to be able to do that. And if we wanted to keep that, our students were not going to succeed. So we started doing shorter assignments, shorter things. We knew that we, they were coming to, to the Zoom class, so we had them. So what can we have them learn and do and create or produce right then and there? No outside out of Zoom, like homework, like there's no, that wasn't gonna happen. And so it's like teachers started to capitalize on the time that they had them in person right there. So uh, two questions there. So can you give some examples of those uh, projects uh, during the classes? But also if you slow down so significantly, how do you stay with the federal regulations? Like how do you make sure that they test well? Do they lose a year? What does that mean for them? Yeah, so um, there was no state testing. Um, they canceled all of the, the big major testing, but we did have benchmark. We did have benchmark assessments. And so basically what it was showing was, okay, can we show growth? 
as students were growing within that year. And our students were growing, they were learning, they were still um, producing. It was just not going to be at that same level and caliber. Um, but I think it was happening across the world. So to say that, well, they're behind, they're behind who? Like it's, and the bar, who sets the bar really? Like who determines what it is that they have to know by a particular time set? You know, I think students can can easily, like you said, you did two, you caught up in two months and did something that would create, that we did in a year, right? So it's like, I think we were, we were able to move along and knowing that, okay, when we come back, we'll be able to fill up some of those gaps and we'll be able to do it quickly. And does see does that can. mean that, does that mean that the students who are coming back to school uh, in some parts of the world, they're going to have to have more tests and learn more or? I don't think about, I don't think that it's necessarily testing more. I, I think we need to be smart about what we're teaching and we need to make sure that we're teaching what's relevant and what's necessary. And, you know, long gone are the days of memorizing facts and figures, you know, we don't have to do that. And so it's like, why are we spending so much time on that when we should be teaching, you know, how to apply skills, how to find information, how do you analyze information that you do find, you know, things like that. And so those skills progress through the years and there's no like, oh, they have to know how to do this at this particular time. So, so how do you how do they do state testing if they don't memorize things like history or something? I don't well, know. now the state testing is starting to change where now it's, it's more like they'll show them a video, they'll show them a speech. Now they have to analyze those pieces. And so I think even state testing has changed where they know it's not just a bunch of memorization and, you know, it's more the analysis and the why behind something. They have to now write an argument for something. So right, those pieces of writing that we do, it translates into that state testing. So I think we've come a long way in education from what it used to be of just filling in bubbles of A, B, and C to where it's actually students authentically writing. Wow. So at a really young age, they're pretty much writing essays and, and analyzing statistics. So so is this already like common? Do I find this uh, also all over the world in European schools and everything? Or is this just in this region? That no, this is I think I, I think other countries are far more advanced um, in their educational system than we are. But we are definitely catching up quickly. I think we've come a long way from when we first started SFIM, our school, um, to where we are now, I think more schools are following suit in that approach. And so that's really, it's refreshing to see so many more schools um, changing up the way that they teach, changing up the way that they approach curriculum and even assessments and, and ensuring that students are getting the skills that they need, but in a meaningful way. So it sounds to me like governments have finally recognized that Google exists. And so now they're teaching pretty much analytical skills more than they are facts. And exactly. Stuff. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I think they're start, they're starting to acknowledge the fact that that education has to change. Um, it has to change with what the current um, society is doing and what all of that is out there. You know, we didn't used to have so much technology at our fingertips, so much information at our fingertips. And now there's so many different ways to manipulate media and tech. And it's quick and easy that we need to start teaching our students how to do that. And they're already producers of media. It's just making sure that they do it in a more authentic or productive way as opposed to getting into trouble with it. I mean, if we're going down this conversation, uh, is there then still a need to have 18 years long, you know, schooling? Maybe there's less, maybe people can go to university or college after 16 years old. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think there definitely needs to be flexibility in all of that. And that's, I think, the beauty of the different types of schools and the different models of schools is that there is no one size fits all. 
and what someone needs, um, the next family doesn't. And having the, the, the ability to choose the type of school you go to and the type of program that you attend, that's, that's I think the ideal for families. And having all of these different types of schools um, readily accessible is, is important. And it also creates that healthy competition. You know, you can't just be stagnant anymore and just be like, well, this is a school everyone has to go to. And it's like, no, people have choices now. People get to decide what their education looks like. And they should. They absolutely should decide how, how they want to go through. So if they want to cut off two years, then, you, then yeah, absolutely. Find a program that allows you to cut off two years and, and go that route. You want to still be digital? Find a program that just is all digital. And I think that's the beauty of education is that there are so many different options now. Regarding digital, um, have, have, have the teachers or you maybe noticed, um, I guess, class limitations, as in how many students per Zoom call was too much? Uh, or was it really like all 20 students in one Zoom call? Um, I, I think it wasn't the fact that it was too much. It was more of the fact that it was hard to engage some students where it was almost like they were Zoom ghosts. You know, they were there, but they were not there because they wouldn't respond. They wouldn't respond in the chat. They wouldn't respond in out loud. They wouldn't, you know, you couldn't see them being productive on the back end either. Um, and so it was those students that we had the hardest time trying to reach. And, you know, we even did home visits when we technically shouldn't have. And, you know, we just make sure we're face shields and masks and, okay, well, what's, what's going on and how can we help you? Um, and we try to do a lot of outreach. We try to do a lot of wraparound services for families, um, whether it was food donations. Um, so our district did an amazing job with um, feeding families. So they fed um, every morning for about four hours. They had drive through like food banks at local schools and and families would come and they would pick up boxes of, of groceries for the week, boxes of food. Um, even once we came back partial in person, we were on a hybrid model. We were distributing bags of food after school and families would take them, take two of them, three of them, and be able to feed their family. And, and it was fresh produce, it was fresh fruit and vegetables, and then also, you know, like, school chicken strips and pizzas and things like that that they can heat up easily but but it was giving them food that, that's actually something interesting to discuss um because again i'm in europe but when i watch american um school lunches um i'm a bit shocked actually so do you guys in school like does anybody look at nutrition do people actually get pizza for lunch like how does that work uh, yes so we have you know in the ideal world we would love for our cafeterias to cook lunches again you know make things from scratch um, it has not been like that for a very long time where it is more processed food. They are bringing in more fresh vegetables and more fresh fruit, um, but the main dish tends to kind of be processed food. How come, I can imagine if you have so much control over your school and funding, why wouldn't you want to innovate on this thing, which, I mean, research does show that you will have less crazy children, I guess, hopping around uh, on processed food, to, to put it bluntly. So that's one aspect that I don't have control over, um, is the cafeteria, because it is um, state and federal funded. So that they follow the guidelines of the state. So I don't have any control over it, unless I bring in an entirely separate catering service to come in, and then we just don't have the budget for that. That's um, crazy. So, so the federal government says you have to eat like pizza for lunch. Well, they give you a range of things, um, and so we have been working with the cafeteria services to have more choice for students. So they do bring in more fresh salads, 
Um, but it's been it's it's a work in progress for sure. How We're do not you, at the how do you yet. change that? So obviously you've changed so much. How do you change this aspect? I think it takes a lot of advocating and a lot of lobbying for, you know, the people who make the decisions. It's having to target them and say, okay, this is what it looks like here. And and it's not to say that other schools have done it. I mean, other schools have amazing lunch programs. Um, I think for us, our district is so large. There's over a thousand schools that it's cost effective to do that across the board versus catering. Um, you know, to all of these different schools. And I think that it comes down to funding. Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, and, and there's, well, I guess catering is so expensive, you wouldn't be able to even get sponsorship for it. Yeah, for, a, for 180 days of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's, <laughs> if you can find me an organization that'll do that, hey, we're on board. Well, hopefully somebody listens. Uh, but um, but you guys provide the breakfast as well because you allow students to come in earlier. Mm-hmm. Wow. So they get breakfast, lunch, and supper. So they take home um, dinner. Oh, wow. That's... Uh, so wait, and the parents don't pay for this? No. Wow, that, I, that probably is such a huge uh, financial load off of many parents. Though. Yes. So they and so this is going across the board um, at all of the district schools this year. Everyone eats for free. So is it specifically for this year or have you been doing this for the last decade? We have been doing this. Um, Our school qualifies for free, um, free lunch because of the poverty level. Um, And most of the schools in in the area do as well. Um, But for this year, all of the district schools are eating for free. And so that's a, a thousand or so schools with free breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Just out of interest, um, if it's such a poor community, uh, is it dangerous or like, or is it just the same? Or how are the children? Is there more gangs, violence? Like what, what is happening? I think the community has changed <clears throat> um, over the years. At one point there was high gang violence, um, drive-by shootings, that kind of thing was very prevalent. I think it has calmed down um, quite a bit, but still some of our students are gang affiliated. Some of our students still live in neighborhoods where it's not so safe. Um, We have a high homeless rate as well, so there's a lot of homeless encampments that may be on the route to school that they have to walk through and things like that. Um, and so, yeah, and with, with poverty comes comes a whole lot of other family issues that may arise, whether it's alcoholism, drug abuse, um, those kinds of things. And so our students are definitely dealing with, with those pieces as well as single family homes, whether it's mom only or dad only some of them are living with grandparents and they don't have either one um how do you um well a two-part question then how do you kind of protect the children then make sure that they see another world that's more stable uh, that there's a different future um and secondly from the teacher's perspective i can imagine not everybody had a rough past so how aren't they scared walking through those neighborhoods or something like yeah yeah so um we have counselors on site plus a psychiatric social worker um and so we do groups so if when we know students are dealing with certain aspects um we do small group like therapy sessions um it could be weekly some are every two weeks or something like that depending on um the need if they're going through grief um, or you know alcoholism, drug abuse, those kinds of things, then we we show them coping mechanisms, and we really try to outreach to families um, and trying to get them support as well. So we connect them with outside services with mental health, um, so that they can do family therapy sessions. They can do um, different resources depending on their need. Um, and in terms of in the classroom. 
um, it's we build like a family feel here so students may or may not disclose to each other what they are going through um, but teachers are aware as much as possible of the various needs and try to ensure that they're inclusive and that they are not you know sticking anyone out or put or making anyone be an example of any particular issue and so just trying to to show support then you know making themselves available too outside of of school hours i think that also shows our students that they can count on an adult they can count on 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 us to be there for them isn't that too much pressure for a teacher almost it's like they're like parents for these children almost yeah i mean we're we're parents we're psychologists we're um we're all of it and for some of them we're the only ones that they have and so it definitely takes um a different type of person to work in this community it's not for everyone it's not for the weak for sure um but i think the work is so important that that you are so invested in helping these students um you do you get to the point where you're like oh my god if i could just adopt them like they would be okay you know because their home lives are so unstable but it's like yeah you can't adopt them all so it's so like the how teachers do you the teachers really do care and so there isn't this thing that they're scared they're just you know they're there for the students and everything okay, that's no good. yeah and most of our teachers um they went to school in the same neighborhood they I, I, were, I went to school at, at the school that I teach at, at the campus. So I've been on this campus for almost 22 years. And so I think, and even the, the, the teachers who didn't necessarily grow up or live in this particular area, they're still invested. They've been here long enough to where, you know, they, they drive around, they see what's happening and, and they wanna make a difference. They wanna make change. I think one of the main questions that I had as the world is now kind of going back to normal, as, at least as the vaccines are going up and stuff like that, um, is how realistic was the digital experience? From everything that I hear from you, it was like, oh, I guess we had to do it, but it's definitely not, you know, a success. So especially because you guys work project based. So... Is that correct? Is there any chance for digital learning? <laughs> well, I think some of our kids did amazing on the digital platform. They did better digitally than they did when they were on campus. And then others were so much better in person than they were digital. And so I think it just really, it opened our eyes to having that combination of the two things in order for all of our students to be able to flourish. Um, but I think it also forced our country to accept the fact that there is a digital divide, that they had to put devices in every single student's hands. We had been fighting for one-to-one -one computing for years, and it was like, we don't have funding, we don't have funding, there's not enough money, we can't do that, That's, it's impossible. And it's like, all of a sudden, the pandemic hit, and all of a sudden, there's money. And now, all of a sudden, every single kid has a Chromebook. And then if they didn't have Wi-Fi, they had a hotspot, and it's like, why couldn't we do this 10 years ago, five years ago, and think of how much further we would have been if these resources were available to our students. And so acknowledging the fact that not all of our families were able to, and even some, even with a hotspot, they still were not able to connect. Just depending on where they lived, the closer to the mountains they lived, that hotspot wasn't working. Um, and so trying to come up with the infrastructure as a society, how are we not amplifying Wi-Fi signals? Like, why can't our school, each one of our district schools, be a hub and amplify your Wi-Fi so that it, it goes all to the neighboring houses? So then that takes care of, if each school became a hub, then wouldn't we all have Wi-Fi? Because there's over a thousand schools in our, in our district. And so being able to figure out how is it that we can get reliable resources to our families, especially the ones who need it the most. And, and so I think that there were some pros and cons to it, for sure. So now that the infrastructure is available, what are the next steps? Like, how is your school going to change if some students were performing digitally better? I, for instance, when I look back at my um, experience in school when I you know did two years in one, um, that was me just working at home pretty much. When I did university, the classes that had 
uh, online classes available, I had the highest scores. And so apparently there were also students in, in your school like that. So how do you how do you combine that? Like, what are the next steps? How are you going to do things differently um, going forward? Well, I think we're still using our learning management system of Schoology. And so being able to to mesh the two worlds and being able to have the a lot of the apps that teachers learned how to use um, during distance learning is bringing those back and knowing that, okay, well, those were really helpful, you know, whether it was Nearpod or Desmos or whatever that was that they were using, incorporating that into the in-person instruction and still giving students those options and choice. You know, students need to be able to choose um, to some extent how they produce or create something and and definitely having that digital component. Um, those who were more comfortable in that in that fashion run with it. And those who needed more of a, you know, back to paper pencil type of thing, then they can do that too. So um, another question that I had, if I reflect back again as a student, a lot of reflection today, uh, but um, I, sometimes I would have to um, go on a bus for two hours. By the time I arrived, I would have missed the first half hour of class. Um, and obviously, when we got tested, a question would pop up from that class. Um, so how realistic is it that certain classes get recorded and go on this learning management platform for the students who come from far or get sick or whatever uh, and then can look back on a class? Is that realistic? Um, I think it's, it's challenging um, to be able to do that with every single thing. Um, but I think it's also, teachers don't lecture anymore, you know, where they're just like standing up there and talking to, to students. Like it's, it doesn't work like that. They're more like facilitators of, of information. Um, so it'll be more like, okay, well watch this video clip, read this excerpt, and then now we're going to apply that to this particular. So, you know, it's you can have all of those resources still on the learning management system, and it's about putting them in steps. And it's like, okay, if you do this one first, then you do this one, and then they facilitate an activity um, that incorporates the the learning or the content. That is so interesting. It just shows how uh, I guess old I am, or something. <laughs> <laughs> I keep uh, say I keep reverting back to how I was taught, and in the meantime, obviously, like everything has changed. Um, yeah, interesting. Um, you guys uh, are now going back to normal learning. That's what you said uh, at the beginning, right? How, how does that work now? Oh, obviously, September is coming on. So... Well, we start next Monday. Oh, you start in August. Right? So how was the process like? So families still have an option to do distance learning. It's just not, it's going to be almost like a separate school. And so all the students from our district who decide to stay in virtual learning will be enrolled in this other school. And then um, they will have kind of the same like Zoom sessions plus independent study, that kind of deal. Then the rest who want to come back in person, come back in person. And we have, you know, safety protocols, um, social distancing, hand sanitizer everywhere. Classrooms are set up a little bit different. Do the children space. have to be vaccinated to come back? No, they don't have to be vaccinated, but they do have to wear masks. And then we have weekly on-site testing. So every week, um, students get tested, students and staff get tested for COVID. So for us, for my school, it's every Wednesday. So we have a mobile testing team that comes out and we basically class by class, we take students down to the gym and they line up and they all get tested every Wednesday it's not a very nice test I had right a times. and you know and the first time that we did it I was like wow this is what school is like like it's just weird to see the the tents and you know the nurses all gloved and masked and everything and you're like I don't think I ever really pictured school being like this but I think it's Part of what helps to keep the school site safe, you know that the students that students and staff that are on campus are negative and it gives a little bit more peace of mind. And uh, there is no plans to make it mandatory to get vaccinated like all the other vaccines that children need to get? 
Not yet. I mean, I think it, they're highly encouraging everyone to be vaccinated, um, but it's definitely still a personal choice to, to be vaccinated. Because I can imagine if they come from those poor families and then, you know, one of them gets COVID and then the whole week, no income is just going to be horrible for. Right. And we even had um, as a district, they offered vaccines um, free to all um, students that were eligible. And then as well as their families, all employees were able to receive the vaccine. Um, so I think as a district, we've been making everything available as much as possible to those who want it and putting out as many resources. And so I think our district has really done a great job with that. Yeah, well, can do more than that, I guess. Um, so now the students are coming next week already. That's crazy. Um, and you mentioned a lot of them have never kind of been in that school except for the whole zoom experience um what are you going to do different in that first week is there going to be more therapy like what does an if innovative school like yours do yeah so we're doing so we're kind of starting almost like summer camp you know where they come in they're going to be in in groups or like a team and it's going to be more of those team building activities school campus tour, making sure they know where everything is. Um, it's like if they were brand new students. Um, and so getting reacclimated. And so even the teachers are coming in this week, they're coming in early um, to plan a lot of those activities. What does it look like, you know, for a sixth grader coming in for the first time or a seventh grader? And really working as a team to build some of those systems in place um, so that yeah, we're not going to hit the ground running with content, for sure. We're not going to hit the ground with tests. You know, like that's not <laughs> that's not our first priority. Our first priority is to reacclimate our students back into some of them. You know, you have varying degrees of quarantine. Some of our students have not been around anyone at all. Others have been kind of out in the community. And so it's just kind of being sensitive to all the different comfort levels. Aren't you a little bit sad you'll be missing out on all the students that go to this other virtual school? Um, and also, aren't you scared that there are gonna be these Zoom ghosts that don't actually participate? I, I do, I, I worry about all of them. You know, um, even my own who's going to return to school, who's in elementary. And it's like, you know, you have, I think it's good that we offer all of the different options and each family gets to decide what works best for their children um, and what works best for their families and what their what their comfort level is with the various options. I think for me as a parent, um, I am okay sending my child back to school because I, I'm a principal too, so I know what the principal is doing at that school. and and I have confidence that she's gonna be safe. Um, and especially since there's weekly testing, you it's that, like I said, that layer of, okay, everyone on site is, is negative, is testing negative. And there's a process for contact tracing that we've been really good at. The hybrid, um, when we came back partial, we didn't run into any major um, issues. And so I think that we're gonna be in a good place. And, and at some point, you know, we we have to start trying to open schools. We need to start trying to do something. Um, you know, I mean, how long do you stay closed till everything's gone? Or no, I mean, at this point, everybody who wanted a vaccine could have gotten a vaccine. So you know, personal choices have been made. Uh, I think at this point, I guess you can just start opening up. Um, no need to hurt like the economy and people more um, and if obviously like people still want the vaccine they can get it so uh, I guess I have a more general question getting away from the whole vaccine I know that in, in the US it's more politicized than it's in Europe um, uh, but if you're uh, looking in general uh, of the last I mean almost two years uh, for these students um, does that affect their social uh, 
like dynamic are they like how do you compensate for have they lost friends are they still interacting and do they still have friends uh, i have no idea of course but like w what is happening on the social side and what have you seen the effects to be how have you helped with those effects yeah. so i think a lot during the pandemic we were dealing with a lot of students um, facing depression and just not being able to connect with their peers, not having that social interaction. It's important to them. It's important to their development. And I think as people in general, um, some of the adults were having a hard time grasping that, you know, so it felt like your legs got cut off. You couldn't do anything. Um, and so really teaching them kind of coping strategies. Like, what can you do? How can you engage with your, with your friends um, in, in a safer way. And so some teachers were holding like Zoom lunch sessions and the kids would just come in for lunch and it's like, oh, just grab your lunch, whatever you're gonna have. And we're just gonna eat and chat. You can either turn your camera on or not, or it doesn't matter, like, you know, very low stakes. Um, they would play games. They would have game nights on Fridays. And so we started like trying to, how can we create a social atmosphere in the digital, in the Zoom world? Um, and so we did it like that. And teachers would just hold Friday night movie nights where, okay, everyone get on, we're gonna watch a movie and we'll talk about it or we'll chat or we'll laugh. And, and at least you're kind of, you feel like you're with your friends at a theater, you know, kind of thing. Um, but definitely when they come back, our plan is to, to have a lot more of those conversations of, okay, how do you, how do you start to make friends again? How do, you, how do you initiate a conversation with someone you don't know? You know, we're starting with kindness week. The first, you know, you have to say hi to four new people, you know, or, you know, give a sticker to someone you don't know, um, things like that. So that they're kind of forced, encouraged, I would say, to, to get to know new kids. Um, we're doing these grams the first week of school as well, kindness grams where, you know, they send one to a friend and they just have positive affirmations on them you know, welcome back, you're amazing, don't be afraid to be you, um, things like that. And so we're gonna make sure that every student gets one delivered to their class by Friday. Um, and then of course, the ones who give them to each other. And so, but at least everyone will have one. Um, and we're having our leadership students handwrite the messages. So they're almost like adopting one advisory class. So every student's gonna get a handwritten one from a student. Um, and so kind of those that kind of activities to reopen the door. Wow. Um, we're slowly nearing the end. So I just kind of want to ask more general questions about the future. Then um, you, I mean, handled it really well from what I hear. Um, just in the fact that as teachers, you guys, you know, won over uh, the, the school. I think that's kind of noble almost what you did um, how do you see the future happening now um, for the whole world what would you if, in the, if budget was not a restraint how would the ideal school kind of look like uh, and how would all students in the world be educated um, yeah well, I think for sure, resources shouldn't be a hindrance. You know, computers and Wi-Fi should be a non-negotiable because that's something that gives you access to to everything. And you know, Wi-Fi we take for granted <laughs> until it's down, and then you realize that your entire life just shut down because there's no Wi-Fi, right? Or if you didn't have your cell service, like what happens to you at that point? And so, if you think about it, you have entire populations that live like that with zero cell service, with zero smartphones, with no, there's nothing. So they're at such a disadvantage. And so I think that really just needs to be across the board, like the non-negotiable. Um, and from there, the I think the decision making needs to be in the hands of the people closest to students, because each population demographic, different types of schools have different needs. And for for me to decide what a different another school needs is going to be completely different from what my students need. And that's not fair to say that you have to do this just because it's working for me. It may not work somewhere else. Um, and it's important to give schools flexibility, flexibility to make those decisions 
and use their funds and use their resources the way they need to, to help their students. And I think you can trust the educators. You know, they went to school, they're trained, they're, you know, let them use their expertise. And I think too many times we overlook the fact that teachers know what they're doing. They, they are the experts in the classroom and we need to give them the freedom to, to work their magic because they can be amazing. I, uh, I really like that. I wish we could close on that one, but I actually just had a question pop up in my mind um, about um, just, again, my friends when I was growing up. Um, have you had students that um, skip years or that the teacher recommends to go a year higher or two years higher? Um, how does that process work? I've never been able to find how that process work works on Google. Uh, I don't understand what triggers the teacher to do that for some students and not for others. Um, I'll actually give you an example. I know that my sister was considered by the teacher to uh, go one year higher, but then the principal said no. So just out of interest, because I finally have a principal here on the podcast, what does that process work like? What, why can a principal say no when a teacher says, like, how does that work? So it's not necessarily a common practice. And I think part of it is because of the social emotional aspect. So if you put a 12 year old in classes with 15 year olds, then the dynamic changes and it's not necessarily conducive for a 12 year old to be around nothing but 15 year olds. Um, so I think that's what, what is the hesitation with skipping students. Um, but what they do have are accelerated classes. So students who are showing you know, tremendous just growth and insight, um, then they put them in more accelerated classes that go deeper, faster, and further into curriculum. Um, so there's a lot of advanced placement options. Um, and so that seems to be more of the route that schools take versus skipping them entire grade levels because of the social interactions. Um, they have found that it's, it's not the most conducive to their development. So you can still challenge their mind without holding them back in, in the sense mm. of that social aspect. So that's what the advanced classes are for then, so that you can still keep them with their age group, but just go a bit deeper. Mm -hmm. And so you can do a lot more specialized courses, advanced courses and things like that, but you still stay with your age group who are also advanced. So, you know, you're, you're still getting challenged and, and you're moving forward at, at a faster pace than say at a, a traditional student, um, but you stay with your age group. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so much to discuss. I could talk for hours with you. Um, however, um, I would love to ask you, I would like to roll out the red carpet for you. Do you have anything to promote, anything to share, any systems or books that our audience should read? Um, any last words to our audience as well? No, I think we're always looking for donations and funding and new programs um, that are coming out. We like to be at the cutting edge of, of technology and of things that are happening out there. And so if any startup companies have a new curriculum that they might be wanting to execute and they, they need someone to pilot, um, we, we're we always interested in, in, in finding different ways that our students can learn, um, especially innovative new things. So look us up. That's a really good closing. We have a lot of startups who follow us. So. <laughs> And thank you so much for being on the podcast. And um, yeah, looking forward to maybe having you in the future on again. Yes, thank you so much. It was great. If you like this episode, you can check out our most recent one here. And if you haven't already, make sure you click here to subscribe and see the next one. But if you're interested in more tips and tricks, then make sure to join our Facebook group where you can find thousands of like-minded people and you get direct access and support to any business question from the entire startup funding 